All right, guys. Hey, we're back with the rest of the chapter 17 video. So welcome. This is the first video that I'm recording this year from my classroom at King Drew. So yes, it feels good to be back on campus and hopefully next semester um, I'll have a chance to maybe meet some of you all maybe later on this semester some of you are coming back onto campus but you know hey let's just get right into it um, so one more time just so we can see that we are focusing on chapter 17 um, that deals with nations and empires between 1850 and 1914 um, so let's just go right back to slide number 22. All right, so I, uh, the last one we were talking about was uh, the domestic discontent growing in France and in Great Britain and, and how, um, you know, this idea of, uh, of liberty as it's kind of spreading around and how we're kind of seeing that it's being treated unequally, especially in places that are colonizing or um, imperializing other, um, other nations in Africa, Asia, and in South America as well. Um, so let's talk about industry, science, and technology and what all this means. So once again, chapter 17 is probably one of the more important chapters for really understanding where the world is today and why we have certain power structures the way that we have them. So let's talk about the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. So that first wave we know is going to start um, around in Great Britain, right, right around the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, with the invention of like the steam engine and, and you know, and utilization of coal and iron and so many other things to kind of really benefit in making mass production in factories and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So now we have a second one that's going to arise. And this second industrial revolution is going to begin around 1850. And it's going to re- order global relationships with Western Europe, um, experiencing a second industrial revolution and Japan industrializing. So once again, we have Western Europe is going to experience another form of an, another industrial revolution. And then a place that had previously not been as um, industrialized before uh, Japan is going to rise up during this time period. And then Russia is going to be behind it. And there's going to be a few other countries that are also going to um, industrialize and rise to the height of some of the other countries in Western Europe. So what does this new revolution mean? So we have new materials, technologies, and business practices. Number one, new organic sources of powers and new ways to get sources of power, sources to processing plants. All right, so those organ organic sources of power. So we're gonna see those pop up and actually let me pause. All right, so I was looking up those organic um, uh, sources of power. So one of those is going to be oil. So we know that oil is going to be an organic source of power. It causes a lot of other environmental harms and issues that we know of that we're dealing with today, like greenhouse gases and a lot of pollutants and things like that. Um, but for them, that was, you know, awesome. We can tap into this, you know, unlimited resource and, and, and really make a lot of money. And then we also have new ways to kind of process coal and also making the steel process much easier and more efficient along the way. Um, electricity is going to slash production cost. Um, so no longer is everything relying upon coal to kind of, um, you know, coal to um, fuel everything that's happening. We have oil, we have electricity, we have things that are able to slash production costs and make them more efficient. Still, it's going to become essential for shipbuilding and railways. Um, one, one thing that we can see as a modern connection to steel that we have in the U.S., we have a football team called the Pittsburgh Steelers, and we can guarantee that steel was made in that Pittsburgh region of the United, or the Philadelphia region of the, excuse me, the Pennsylvania region of the United States um, during that time period between the 1850s all the way, honestly, till now. Um, all right, so the revolution saw new business practices develop, so we're going to see large banks, uh, banks, major providers of funds. Um, so, you know, your Wells Fargo's, your Bank of America's, your JP Morgan Chase's, your um, all of those kind of older banks that um, are still around today that were profiting off of slavery. Um, they're still around, um, still making money, still thriving. And that idea of this large bank is going to come during this time period. So if you are in business and you're making tons of money and you have to go to different, like, you know, basically if you're doing business around the world or doing different business in different parts of the U.S. or uh, in 
Western Europe or wherever, wherever you go, you should be able to have access to your money and to your, your funds. Um, and if you're not able to have money, that's a problem. So having these banks be large conglomerates or large connected things um, where you're able to provide funds for things, businesses that you want to run, things like that. We also have the creation of limited liability joint stock companies to raise capital. Um, and these are gonna be eventually gonna be seen kind of as like, I don't wanna say monopolies in a way, but they're kind of gonna be monopolies in that they're gonna really take over and control and dominate um, the steel marketplace or the oil marketplace or transportation um, or logistics and things like that. So we have US Steel, we have Standard Oil and we have Siemens. Um, and they're going to all uh, be limited liability joint stock corporation or cap companies um, and to some extent all three of these companies are still around to this day, just have changed names, except for Siemens. There's the only ones with these same, same name. All right, the integration of the second revolution, second industrial revolution. So the integration of the world economy. The second industrial revolution concentrated and reinforced um, economic powers in North Atlantic society. So that Western Europe, and then also the, 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 the United States of America, those are gonna be those North Atlantic societies where we're gonna see um, economic power being reinforced in those areas. There's gonna be a movement of labor and technology. The world's economy created labor demands leading to vast movements of workers. So movements of workers, people are going to be immigrating with an E out of their home countries and immigrating with an I into some of these um, considered more industrialized countries um, that are going to be along the North Atlantic area. So Indians worked on sugar plantations and railroads in the Caribbean, Mar uh, um, Fiji, South Africa, and East Africa. So India, Indians from Indian, India, India. Um, are, are um, going to move around to all of these areas. And these areas still to this day have large Indian populations. In the Caribbean, they're called West Indians um, because it's a mixture of Caribbean and Indian heritage and cultures. Um, Chinese workers worked on railroads in the US and in sugar plantations and in, in Cuba. Um, even to this day, Cuba still also has a large population of Chinese, or I won't say a large, but has a, a significant population uh, of people with Chinese or mixed Chinese heritage. Um, if we think about the railroads throughout the US, US, we think about the freeway systems or the original railroads in the United States or in California, excuse me, most of those are going to be built um, by Chinese labor. And we're going to, you know, get Chinese labor. Um, I don't even want to talk about that because as much as we take in Chinese labor, we're also going to create the Chinese Exclusion Act and try to exclude Chinese people as well. Anyway, moving on. So we have the Irish, the Polish, the Jewish people, Italians, and Greeks are going to flock factories in North America. Um, so originally, you know, the immigrants that were targeted oftentimes are going to be the Irish, the Poles, the Jewish people, the Italians, the Greeks, all of them are going to be, um, you know, the, un the undesirable immigrants coming into the U.S. Um, but we'll see over time that that is going to kind of change. Um, anyway, we'll move on to that though. So Italians are going to harvest wheat and corn in Argentina. So we have people going from Europe all the way into South America just to make a living. So lots of immigration, lots of movement happening, all because of uh, the economic demands and where the money is flowing. So increased integration and continued European expansion. So steam-powered gunboats and breech-loading rifles open new territories for conquest and trade. So a steam-powered gunboat. So not only can it move up and down uh, waterways without needing wind, it's steam-powered, but also it has guns on it so it can move fast and there's guns. Oh, if you are not industrialized, you are looking at a really hard time right now. Um, we also have breech loading rifles that are going to open up new territories and conquest of trade. So not, I don't have to have my, my, my musket where I have to, you know, put the bullet in there, push it down, put the gunpowder in there, push that down. Um, now I have a front loading rifle where I can just do -do -do, do -do, pow, and we're good to go. Um, and so that's going to make it easier to take over and make money and conquer and everything. So railroads are gonna facilitate movement of people and goods to coastal ports. Um, so no matter where we are in the world during this time period, we're looking for our ports. We're looking for those coastal places that are going to allow for the movement of people and goods very rapidly. And so there's also gonna be a big move to kind of create more canals in the United States. Um, so we are not the in the world, excuse me, we have the Panama Canal being built um, in the country of Panama in um, South America or Central America. 
And then we have the Suez Canal being built in Egypt. And just so you guys know, a canal is just going to be a waterway that's going to create more efficient uh, uh, um, travel through an area that was uh, previously land. So the Suez Canal, that part of North Africa, they're going to, you know, turn that into a waterway. The Panama Canal, that's the part... Um, in the Central America or in that, yes, in Central America, um, that kind of connects North and South America together where they're just gonna, you know, create a waterway there and now people can roll their boats through that waterway. So the Suez Canal is gonna allow for more efficient travel between Europe and Asia. And the Suez Canal has its own incredibly imperialistic uh, colonized uh, uh, history as well. So we have the telegraph cable technology created quicker uh, communication as well. So having those telegraph lines where you're able to, you know, um, able, not necessarily have a phone call just yet, but able to and send messages more quickly and more efficiently. All right. So, all right. So now the industrial age and natural philosophy. So Charles Darwin and natural selection, you know, um, I gotta be honest, I am not a big Charles Darwin fan. Um, bothers me a lot um because you know oftentimes when we hear about like his natural selection and what all that he did in the galapagos islands what they're not telling you is that he also was uh categorizing people by their races and he is kind of one of those original people that's gonna kind of push some racist science what we now know is kind of social darwinism into our forefront but anyway charles darwin is going to be a british scientist who's going to create origin of species it's going to lay out the process of natural selection the struggle for existence among species for a limited food supply along with sexual selection resulted in the fittest surviving um, to reproduce. So only those who had the means to survive, to, to sustain themselves, those are going to be the ones who, you know, end up making it. Um, that applies to animals, birds, humans, everything. All right. So once again, this Darwinism, this Darwin's concept. So we have Darwinism, survival of the fittest. Social Darwinism applies to kind of how, you know, the, the, the uh, ordering or the ranking of human beings in our society. Um, and so basically try to emerge to justify the sufferings of the underclass. Well, the reason why you're suffering is because you're not fit. It's because, you know, you're just you know, you're struggling for existence and you're not going to make it because you don't have the right tools and resources. What? Anyway, that's, that's the mentality. Number two, the right to rule. So they said that, you know, strong states should rule over weaker nations. Is that kind of paternalistic? Well, if you should, if you were going to be on top, you, you should be leading. And if you're not on top, then you're not leading and you're at the bottom and we should take care of you because you're at the bottom. That paternalistic uh, belief, like that paternal, like thinking that they're your father kind of belief. And then we also have European racial and cultural superiority. So we already have the buddings of these racial, racial hierarchies, these racial caste, um, this, this Rat, this ladder that they, they have created about the different rungs of society um, and then also cultural superiority so those that aristocratic society those monarchs um, those who have means and even enlightenment you know you're only enlightened if you are a property owning white man and everyone else good luck okay all right so how does all that you know arise and what does that look like in application all right, so we have all these European nations who are being influenced by Charles Darwin saying that, yo, you were on top because you're, you're the fittest, you're the best. So they're gonna take that mentality. Well, now I have science to back up where I am in the world. So we kind of see for the first time that science is, I won't say for the first time, but I, more pervasively seeing that science is going to be used to back up um, inaccurate um, beliefs held in society. Um, and so this is, is going to be a, a one that unfortunately I feel like some people still share to this day about races being different when they are absolutely incredibly similar. Just depends on how far away you are from the equator, depends on what color your skin tone is, um, or it did back in, in, in the earlier times. So global expansionism and the age of imperialism. In the late 19th century, increasing European rivalries created a frenzy of imperialism and territorial conquest, primarily in Africa, but also in Asia too. So this nation building. So as you know, this idea, the shared language, history, culture, all that stuff happens. So as they're building that nation, we also have this nationalism concept rising where my country is only better if it is dominating and if it is number one. And so we are kind of just now entering or exiting out of the belief during this time period where 
the world's income is fixed. So mercantilism. So the amount of the, the amount of wealth in the world is fixed. So if it's if it's 10 slices in the world, there's only 10 slices and I can't get any more. Well, we're kind of easing out of that and realizing that wealth can be produced based on what goods you have and who you're able to sell them those things to. So that means you need to have more markets to sell your goods to or more lands to acquire more uh, resources to, you know, have more capital, you know, more, more things to merchandise, things like that. Um, so we're going to see that this nationalistic viewpoint is going to really, really be applied to how they interact in Africa and, and Asia, especially with the scramble for Africa that we're going to learn about very, very soon. First, let's talk about Asia though. So we have British rule in India. So the British rule um, and the imperial model, so imperial, so imperialism, so how England is going to rule this territory that it has. So there's going to be two different ways that we're going to see people being led. And I hate to say it, but usually it's based on the color of the people's skin. Um, so if you're going to be, you know, a, a place where you have more African people, well, guess what? You're going to have more direct rule and more Europeans directly in your country. If people are a little bit lighter or not seen uh, as low on that, that ladder, that, um, that, that survival of the fittest ladder that, that, that Darwin has created, well, guess what? Then they are going to be going to have more indirect rule and indirect rule means that the people who are in India, who look, who, who look like the people, yeah. That means that the people who are in the colonized country are going to maintain a piece of order, um, even though it's off for show, they're still going to technically um, have some power and some say in their um, country, even though Great Britain is really pulling the strings. All right, so let's talk about Great Britain. Though. So British rule in India provided a model for other imperialistic rulers. All right, so idea of developing colonial infrastructure to maximize profit from trade. So they're going to spend money to gain more money. They're always like, oh my God, look at all the great things we did in India. And it was great. It was wonderful, but it had a major consequence um, to what people were experiencing um, on the everyday in their everyday lives. So the British government replaced in East India Company rule in 1858, a period known as the Raj or the rule. So the East India Company is going to have to leave um, right around the Sepoy Rebellion in that time period, because this is a a company that has been given power by the government of England, and they're able to take taxes, start wars, do all kinds of different things. And, you know, as the world starts to look a little bit more at what's happening and just and being just and being fair, that's not really just and fair for a company to have that much power over a country. So England has to come in and kind of be a more direct ruler, or come in and, and with a little bit more power than and take away the East India Company. All right, so what we're going to see, though, with this Raj rule, we're going to see a modernization of Indian transportation and communication system. So we're going to see rapidly um, there that, in, that England is going to industrialize India for Britain's good. So England is going to industrialize um, India so that England can continue to make money off of India. So by 1910, India is going to have the fourth largest railway railroad network in the world. So we're looking at France, we're looking at Great Britain, we're looking at the United States, we're looking at all these other places, even China. And, and, you know, we're seeing that, man, really rapidly in about 50 years, India is able to rise up with their infrastructure. Other public works projects included dams and telegraph lines. So those dams, you're able to, um, you know, farm in certain areas or have people living in certain areas. I mean, there's just so many different things you're able to do if you're able to shore up and dam up water. Um, and then we also have telegraph lines. So easier ways to communicate more efficiently and more swiftly without having to rely on mail being transported either by uh, boats or by whatever it is. The British instituted these public works projects to gain better access to raw materials in India and to better distribute British manufactured goods. So it might seem like, oh my God, they're so awesome for them for like creating these roads and these telegraph lines. But once again, Great Britain would not have done that if Great Britain wasn't getting any kind of money out of it. So because Great Britain put a, a dollar sign on the back of the Indians, they were like, yo, we make money off of spending a little bit of money. So it's kind of like that, 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 that saying where it's like scared money don't make no money or, you know, you have to spend some money to make some money um, and that kind of concept. 
So tea plantations in Ceylon and Northeastern Plains of India. So we're going to see more uh, cash crop farming um, that we saw pervasive in other parts of the world that had been colonized or taken over. And so that's also is going to rise up in India during this time period. Um, and India also had been growing all of the opium that was being sold in China for a long time as well. Um, so just thinking about the cash crops um, that were utilized or, or being sold in India to the point where the people were literally going to were starving in India so that they could continue to plant cash crops and be sold around the world. So Indians developed a unified territory and nationality identities as Indians under colonial rule, but were denied basic civic and human rights with no voting rights. So previously, I think I told you guys that the, the Indic culture was a mosaic culture. It was a, P, a fragmented culture from all the different cultures that had arisen up on that Indian peninsula. And it wasn't until now that these people who are the Indic culture are becoming more unified and they're becoming more unified so that they can re uh, 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 rebel against their colonizers eventually and push them out of their society. But they have to unify and show their culture and actually figure out, um, you know, what that means. But while they're unifying as Indians and, 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 and being very clear on their demands on what they want, we see that they are still being denied civic and basic human rights. They're still being abused. They're still being victimized. They're still being treated as less than human beings, even though they're human beings. All right, let's leave Asia or let's leave Southeast Asia and let's go into um, Africa. So Africa bore the brunt of European rivalries and imperialism. Europe carved most of Africa in the colonies in a short period of 30 years. So the late 1800s all the way through the early, late 1800s through the early 1900s, we're gonna see this what we call the scramble for Africa. So the scramble for Africa, we see that European nations in the US did not excuse me, that they did not care about the nations that were already in Africa, those cultures, those languages, those histories, those, those traditions, all those things they were claiming to care about in Europe or in North America, um, we're not seeing that same cause or justification or, or, or level of respect, reciprocality given to uh, the African continent. So partitioning Afri the African landmass. Delegates from Europe, the US, and the Ottoman Empire agreed to carve up Africa and recognize claims of its first European power that claimed control of a territory. So one more time, all of these people, all of these countries, people in, uh, countries in, the U in Europe, the US, the Ottoman Empire, they're gonna meet and agree to carve up Africa and not include any of the Africans in this planning. So this, this is gonna go horribly. All right, so the new colonial boundaries are going to ignore previous African states, ethnicities, languages, cultural and commercial centers, all so that, they, that, that Europeans and the U.S. and the Ottoman Empire will have access to ports and trading routes. So they're going to ignore everything and cause so much turmoil, lasting turmoil in Africa to this day based on these artificial borders that were created to benefit these uh, these colonizing or imperializing countries. The motivating motivation for conquest and partitioning Africa. So interest in Europe and South Africa, um, a fantasy of great treasures locked in the interior. So there's this belief that, you know, we've only been able to go on the outskirts of Africa. And we, as in like European, Europeans, oh my God, what if we could go on the inside? There's like, I bet you there's like, the mountains are like gold and there's like diamonds like on the ground. You just walk around and you pick one up and there's a diamond. So how it, oh my God, that's the belief that that was happening in actuality. That's not true. Okay. Um, so, um, so we also see the European explorers excited readers with accounts of Africa and its unlimited economic potential. So once again, people are like, you just walk around, you just, <laughs> a diamond just fell, uh, there was a diamond, oh, there's some gold, uh, whatever, all the resources that you need were supposedly just like right there, which is not true. You believed it. All right. Um, and so let's talk about some of the negative things that are, are going to happen as a result of the scramble for Africa. So number one, we have King Leopold II. He's going to be from Belgium. And we have the Congo Free State. 
So it's believed that he killed between four and six million people. Um, if not, actually four and eight million people were believed to have lost their lives in Congo when King Leopold was in power. Um, they had a mining industry where they were mining for precious metals and, 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 and stones. And if they thought you were lying or stolen, they would just chop off your arms or your legs or your limbs or whatever it is. Um, so there were, you know, four to eight million people who died in the, in, in the Congo, but there are millions more who were permanently maimed um, just because King Leopold's abusiveness and not seeing these uh, Congolese citizens as human beings who deserve respect and not to be victimized and abused or used as slaves. All right, so then we have Cecil Rhodes, another European dude I don't like. So Cecil Rhodes is gonna champion British imperialism in South Africa, Southern Africa, with the creation of Rhodesia, um, Naya Salaland and uh, Bachelon land in Transvaal and the Orange Free State. So Rhodesia's. So he made a North and a South Rhodesia because one wasn't enough. He needed two countries, but he was also involved in the development of these other nations as well. Um, yeah. So Cecil Rhodes. The reason why he's really famous too. So he has. Um, there is a group of, there's a scholarship called the Rhodes Scholarship, and it's supposedly for some of the smartest people in the whole entire world. Um, people apply for it and you end up uh, getting trained, I think four or five different um, uh, English schools. So the Rhodes Scholar Scholarship is paid for um, from an endowment that was created by Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes got his money by colonizing and victimizing and oppressing um, African populations. So we can see that, that the money that he acquired there from Africa is, is still being utilized today with road scholarships and things like that. So you guys can see the long lasting impact of some of these things. It's not over just because um, these African nations are, are no longer under European control. Um, the impact of that European control is still heavily available and around. All right, so what are the reasons why um, we're gonna see Europeans coming in? So I, I talked previously about that paternalistic belief that that viewpoint that you know these are my children these these colonized nations are behind because they're like children and they need some help like they need a father to, to guide them and help them up um there's also this belief that it's the white man's burden to fix all of the things that are wrong with um you know black brown indigenous communities if they you know we really have to save their souls and another thing too is going to be this christianizing mission so we're going to see Europe's civilization missing. So we're going to see missionaries went ahead of the European armies to convert the souls to Christianity because Christianity was thought was going to be what was going to be used to rise them up um, to the level of a human being and, and to save their souls and all that stuff. Um, but we saw in actuality that Christianity in some places um, and oftentimes was used as a tool of colonialism to um, show people of their, their history, their culture, their, their, their whatevers. But we, we also see too, we've learned earlier in the, uh, the year um, that we still have the synchronism happening, um, the syncretism happening where African and, and, and indigenous and Latin American communities um, were still able to retain some of their culture and their saints and their gods, but just kind of mix that into the religion, the Christianity that we know of today. So that's why when you go to like black and brown churches, sometimes they can be a little bit more lively with dancing and song and, and music. And you can have a pastor who is, you know, yelling at you or not yelling at you, but really just really emotional and feeling, feeling, feeling the message. And that is directly related to some of our indigenous traditions that carried over long after uh, Christianity had kind of come into our areas. All right, so let's look at Senegal and Gambia. So we're gonna talk about these in a second, but I want you guys to look at what is done for Gambia. Do you see how they took a waterway and they cut this little area all the way to a port and they opened that area up? So this once again, you're, you're not, obviously these are, are you're going through many people's, uh, many different people's popular lands or, or things like that. So you're, you're bisecting culture and territory and heritage and traditions and everything by creating this um, and, and no regard at all was shown to it. Um, but we'll talk about these two coming up next. All right, and so then we have our um, Mandera people as well. So we can check out the map of them and see um, what's happening with them. All right. All right, so here is our partitioning of Africa. 
All right, so 1880 through 1914. So we can see which countries are, which European countries are going to have the most parts or the most part, uh, most lands in Africa. We can see that France and Great Britain are gonna be by far the largest land holders um, or controllers, excuse me, in, uh, in Africa between 1880 and 1914, okay? And then we can see there's only two areas that are gonna remain independent. One is Ethiopia, we're gonna talk about that. And the other one is going to be Liberia. Liberia and Sierra Leone were both started. Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone started by Great Britain and Liberia started by the United States like Liberia, Liberty, get it? Um, and so they're both started after slavery ends to give those formerly enslaved people a place to go back to in West Africa, since most of the people who are um, enslaved are going to come from West Africa. So Ethiopia and Liberia, though, are the only two African nations that maintain their autonomy. So African resistance to colonization. So you're going to have different responses and varied responses. Um, in general, people are never going to willingly be like, yo, take my land, do it. I appreciate you. Big ups. Not going to happen. Doesn't happen that way. Okay. Um, so we're going to see that Africans are going to resist European rule in two different ways. They're going to surrender and negotiate with Europeans to limit the loss of autonomy. They're like, yo, if we surrender now, maybe we have a chance at kind of, you know, I don't know, just keeping a little bit of our history, our culture, our land or whatever. And the other way is to fight directly to preserve their independence. And most are gonna fight not really understanding or recognizing that Europe has superior weapons. So we have Africans not having spears and not really having guns during this time period just yet. Um, and so they're going to be annihilated when they're coming into battle, not knowing if they're going against war, uh, guns, things like that, or, or machine guns or rapidly firing guns or whatever it is. So Latvior of uh, Senegal is going to die in battle with the French in 1886, and he's going to be fighting their attempts to infiltrate the interior and build a railroad, railway. So, you know, just like kind of with the freeway systems that go through, oh, we are back at King Drew, see the sirens? Um, so just like the freeway systems that go predominantly through the hoods in the, in, in the United States, or in, in specifically in LA, but really in the United States, um, we can see that in Africa, like people were like, you're not going to knock away my culture just to put a railroad here, like, dude, find another place. Um, but unfortunately, they're going to lose that battle. And then we have a successful person that we have Menelik II of Ethiopia is going to be repulsed, uh, is going to repulse the Europeans by playing European, by playing the European rivals against each other. So he's going to be like, bet, I'm going to play your game. So I'm going to put the Italians against the Germans. I'm going to put the whoever's against the whatever's. Um, and he's going to find ways to kind of pit them against each other. And while he's doing that, he's also building up his military. He's going to get weapons from the French, the British, the Russians, and the Italians. So he's going to find ways to kind of make them put them against each other, but also to use it for his benefits so we can get weapons. Number two, he's going to study some of the uh, European militaries and what they're doing. And he's going to create a united, loyal, well-equipped army based on the weapons they already have. And then two, they're being influenced by um, European military dominance. Then we're going to see the Battle of Adwa in 1896, and Ethiopia is going to defeat the Italians in a well-celebrated moment in African history. Um, so there's going to be some continued battles, but continuously Ethiopia is going to maintain their autonomy and their freedom um, away uh, without being colonized or imperialized by a European nation. Let's keep on going. European colonial rule in Africa. So colonial administration in Africa. So actual power fell to men on the spot or military adventurers, settlers, and entrepreneurs. So just kind of like what was happening in India originally, you have the men on the spot, those direct people who are going to um, be in control of everything. And we have a rough and ready system, a rough and ready systems led to violent African revolts. Um, so Africans are not going to willingly agree to, you know, the abuse, the negative things that were happening. So they're going to fight back, especially when they know they are outnumbering the Europeans. Then colonial rule had to create a more efficient, had to create more efficient administration, healthcare and education. So just like what was happening in India, you got to duplicate that and replicate that in Africa as well. So we need more healthcare, we need more education, we need more efficient administration um, of the, the business, of the, of the economy, of everything that's happening in Africa. And we're going to see that, uh, that Europe is going to make an attempt to do all those things. 
So with civilization goals unmet, Europeans stripped conquerors of absolute powers, monitored them more closely and assumed greater responsibility for colonized people. So because they put all, like because these European nations put all this power in military adventurers and settlers and in entrepreneurs, they failed them. So Europe is gonna be like, yo, if we wanna make this Africa thing work, we actually have to put people that we are, you know, the government people um, in control. So Europeans are going to, are gonna hope that their African colonies will function like British India as exporters of raw materials and importers of manufactured goods. Um, so they were like, yo, in India, we were able to produce goods and they have a huge population. Their population is, is uh, has always been second to China's. Um, so then not only can we produce goods in India, but they also have a huge market to buy our goods. So awesome. But then when it came to the Africans, the Africans don't have that same exposure or those, those needs, those European marketplaces or those goods or manufactured goods. Um, so it's going to be quite an unequal exchange though. So Africans are not going to benefit from the exchange. We're going to see African colonies are going to be um, exporters are going to lose a lot of their raw materials, um, but they're not going to really benefit from the things that are coming into their country. So Africans paid a high cost in regards to their traditions, social, economic, and political lives. So just like in Native uh, American cultures, we're going to see that when Europeans come in and colonize, they're not going to show any respect for their traditions, their cultures, their economy, their political life, their anything. And that's going to lead to major destruction. Um, and no one cared. And even to this day, I feel like a lot of um, communities that were colonized and, and, and taken over are still dealing with the PTSD and after effects um, and the fragmentation that comes along with it as well. Um, so European colonial rule was fragile and relied on African military and police forces. So basically it relied on paid Africans to keep other Africans in line. Um, that's why, you know, everyone who is your skin folk is not your kin folk. Uh, and I'm sure you guys know what that means. Just because someone looks like you does not mean they always have your best interest at heart. But I think that um, Europeans recognized early on that they would get more buy-in and more respect if orders came from people who looked like the people in the country versus from Europeans who came from outside of Africa, Asia, um, South America, North America, and so on. All right, let's talk about the African-American expansionism. the American empire. The US followed European model of colonization. In, the eight, in 1890, the US declared war on Spain and invaded the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. So um, Spain is struggling financially. They are dealing with payment of wars. They are dealing with other turmoil and issues happening in their own country. So they're not necessarily able to really monitor their territories the way they need to be monitored and control them and dominate them. Um, so we're going to see they're going to lose Puerto Rico super easily. And we know that Puerto Rico to this day um, is technically um, controlled by the United States. They should be a state, but another story for another day. Next we're going to see um, that Cubans and Filipinos are going to resist annexation. So they do not necessarily want to be separated from Spain because that means they're going to be controlled by the U.S. They're smart. OK, so we're going to see they're going to resist annexation. Eventually, it's going to happen, though. All right. So the Filipinos are going to launch a war of independence. Um, but after two years of bitter fighting, they're going to become a American colony. OK, so they're going to resist they're like, why would we lose one colonizer in Spain and pick up another one in the U.S.? All right, they're going to try. They're going to resist. They're going to pick it up anyway. Um, eventually, they're going to get their freedom, though. Okay. Um, so the U.S. is going to revise their expansionist model into one in which large corporations with government support aggressively intervened in affairs near and far. So this is a model that Great Britain utilized. So we have this business structure, this corporation structure. They're going to be the ones for really kind of advancing the government's narratives. Um, and even to this day, we see the impact of that. One of those is, uh, ooh, I want to say the Chiqu Dole, Dole, the Dole Company. Um, I want to say like the Chiquita Banana Company. I can't think of the, the, mother, the mother company for that. Um, but there are a lot of companies, even to this day, that are around today that we support today um, that played a role in colonizing um, in Africa and in Central America, unfortunately. Um, so they're going to send troops into the Caribbean and Central American countries with the goal of turning these regimes into dependent states. So we want to basically strip away more culture, strip away more heritage, strip away more legacy and replace it with the United States and kind of how they do business. Uh, 
Okay. And let's see where we are. All right, awesome. Got about 10 more, not too many. So imperialism and culture. All right, so imperialism and culture. So we see European Europeans and Americans were increasingly convinced of their superiority. So I can conquer you, I can take over. So therefore I'm more superior to who you are, which I think is antithetical just because anyway. So Orientalism. So non-Western people were considered exotic, sensuous and economically backward. So we have this fetishizing of these people where um, they're different. I mean, to the point where literally you had in certain European nations, they would uh, they would have the World's Fair, like the World's Fair that we hear about. The World's Fair started off as a way to kind of show off all the exotic things around the world um, and bring them into European nations. So one of those exotic things, or some of the exotic things they would bring in all the time, they were constantly bringing in people, African people, Asian people, um, people who you know look different than the traditional Europeans. Um, and we're gonna see that they're going to parade them around like zoo animals um, just because they're exotic and sensuous and different. Um, so we have social Darwinists believe that it was up to white people and Americans to create a more modern culture as darker people could not catch up. So they're just behind. Like literally they thought that darker people were online like with monkeys. Um, like they're like on the line of apes. So it's like white people up here with God and then you got your monkeys. Pretty much how it went. There are definitely some uh, different races in between that kind of were not quite white, but not quite monkeys. So, so on. So then we have celebrating imperialism. The invention of photographs spread popular images that served as imperial prop imperial propaganda at home and abroad. So you'd see like these poor Africans who are hungry, they're surrounded by dirt and there's no water. So, oh my goodness, we have to feed them. We have to take them over. And if we don't take them over, they're gonna die. All right, so we still have that, unfortunately, that viewpoint um, to this day, okay? All right, um, and then we, all right, imperialist, imperial themes on packaging material. So they're gonna basically say things that, you know, imperialism supports our country, we need it. And if we don't have it, we're going to, you know, not be the, the country that we are basically. Um, let's see, imperialism and culture. Where, all right, um, so um, imperialist packing, I can't find that part and it's okay. I know it's somewhere between 658 and 659 though, okay? All right, so the last one is also gonna prop arguments for population growth in Great Britain as well. Um, okay, oh, there it is, I found it. So after the invention, there we go. Um, There we go. So figure it out. So we're going to see the things they're going to sell, like uh, tobacco, tea, chocolate. They're going to highlight the commodities, colonial origins, like cigarettes. Cigarettes are going to have the name like Admiral, Royal Navy, Fighter, Grand Fleet. Um, all this is going to be propaganda <clears throat> to basically say, yo, our military is amazing. It's elite. And the reason why you have all of this is because of us. All right. And then, as I said previously, prompting the arguments about population growth in, uh, in Europe. All right, so the propaganda. Propaganda promoted imperialism abroad, but also in, inspired changes at home. For example, champions of, of empire argue that if British, if the British population did not grow as fast, did not grow fast enough to fill the world's sparsely settled region, then the population of other nations would. So population was power and the number of healthy children provided an accurate measure of global influence. So basically there's gonna be this push to create more white children in the world. And when you have more white children in the world then you're gonna save the world um, and you know make it a more livable place. But if you don't populate it with European children then the other places will and there'll be a country full, a world full of undesirables. And that's kind of the way that it was is presented and marketed to people. So either you save your country um, or the brown people are gonna kill it off. All right, let's leave and let's talk about so how other places are going to um, really rapidly take over and expand. So the pressures of expansion in Japan, Russia, and China, looking at page like 659 on down. So in Japan, Russia, and China provided three contrasting models of expansion and conquest in East Asia. So the Japanese transformation and expansion. 
All right, let's look at what Japan does. So in the 1850s, the Americans, Russians, Dutch, and British forced, uh, forced the Tokugawa rulers to accept treaties opening Japanese ports. So those unequal treaties that were happening in Japan, well, guess what? Here they, I mean, this, the unequal treaties that were happening in China, well, now they're coming to Japan. All right, here it goes. So in the 1860s, Japanese rulers tried to recast Japan as a modern nation state. So they were like, yo, we have learned from these Europeans who have been coming in. We've been taking notes. Um, we are actually, you know, more modern. We're not, you know, like the other places that need to be taken over. We're, we're, we're pretty advanced. We don't need to be colonized. And so in the 1860s, so 1868, we had the reformers top of the Tokugawa shogunate who are going to be prom uh, and promising to restore Japan to its former mythic greatness. All right, so here we go. So we have Emperor Mushohuto and the Meiji Restoration. So we're going to see the Meiji Restoration. We're going to see the founding of schools, the initiation of propaganda campaigns. So Japan is the best, China is the worst, um, and kind of, and even that's going to lead us into World War One and World War Two. Anyway, and it's also going to revamp its army to create a single na national fighting force. So it's going to look to Europe. It's going to look over there to the east and be large. So, uh, to the west technically um from japan and they're gonna be like yo we gotta get our military up we have to get more modernized we have to um, do more propaganda to prove that we are number one to our citizens and all of that is what's going to happen in japan so they're going to promote pol political community community with linguistic and ethnic hom homogeneity comparative superiority so everyone's going to speak the same language everyone is you know, gonna be pretty much seen as the same. So even if you go in certain places like um, now in like in China and Japan and things like that, um, for the most part, most people who are living there are going to be of Asian heritage and of Asian descent. Um, unlike when you go to other places in the world, like if you go to, you know, parts of North America, um, you might find quite a mixing of bloods and 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 of, of European blood, of indigenous blood, of native, of, 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 uh, of Latin blood, of, African blue, I mean, whatever, it all mixed together. But when you go to certain parts of Asia, you kind of see more homogeneity um, and the lack of mixing of the different racial uh, groups. Japanese transformation and expansion. So economic development. During the Meiji period, Japan's economic economy transformed remark remarkably. So in 1871, the government banned feudalism. So no more of those, you know, uh, those peasants having to work the farms of these gigantic landowners. So in fact, now we're gonna see the peasants are gonna become small landowners themselves. What? We got some buy-in from the peasants. People don't take care of their peasants, but Japan, pretty smart, good idea. You're gonna create a uniform, uh, uniform currency. So now no matter what part of Japan you're in, we have unified money, which is pretty smart as well. So whether you're in Osaka, Hiroshima, Tokyo, Nagasaki, um, Kyoto, wherever you are, now we have a unified currency. It all, all the money spends the same. The postal system for moving things and goods around more rapidly, tax reform so we can continuously have money flowing into the empire, and as well as an advanced civil service examination to fund our and, and to, to fuel our bureaucracy as well. So with 1% of the population voting, Japan's first parliament, the Imperial Diet, was elected in 1891. So still, just like their European homies, they're um, only taking the rich property owning people as the people who are voting. And everybody else, you got some land if you're a peasant, aren't you happy? All right, so Japan developed a large scale managerial corporation based on family dynasty. So your family dynasty and that legacy is what's going to um, lead to corporations and managerial duties. So the government is going to put people in place to run certain companies. So in Europe, we're going to see that business is going to uh, form, I don't want to say more organically, but more in a free market where people are going to, um, you know, kind of have ideas and, and then find funding for those ideas and then spread that, that idea around. That's going to be what happens in Europe. In Japan, they are finding families to intentionally um, create industry. Next up, we're going to see women are going to marry into family alliances and serves as custodians of the home. So they are going to be like the, the big boss of the home and their husband is the big boss outside of the home. All right, so expansion and, you know, issues with the neighbors. Okay, 
Um, all right, so expansion, all right, so if, uh, Japanese expansion and transformation continue. So expansionism in conflict with neighbors. Expansion offered more markets, raw materials, and a chance to assert a country's superiority and greatness. In 1872, Japanese conquered the Raikuyus, the Okin Okinawa, Okinawans, and viewed them as inferior and refused to integrate with them. So we see this first kind of social Darwinism happening um, in Asian society during this time period. So then we have our Sino-Chinese War of 1894 and 1895. So Sino is going to be Japanese forces versus um, Chinese forces. So Japan is going to focus on Korea and put them on a collision course with uh, China. Um, China is going to suffer a humili humiliating defeat and it's going to cede its province in, of Taiwan. One. So China, once again, so up until before, like just before this time period, we see that China is at the, the dominance of the society. They are number one, but they are going to be rapidly left behind because they're not going to allow any kind of outside ideas to come in. And that also includes military ideas or military weapons or whatever. So just like in Africa, where the Africans were over were outgunned and overmatched, um, we're going to see too that the um, Chinese are going to suffer those same issues where they're going to think that they're going to going into a fair battle with the Japanese, but uh, the Japanese have been studying from the Europeans and the Europeans and they have weapons and ideas and military strategies and things like that. So they're going to literally humiliate um, the Chinese. All right. Um, all right, and so we're going to see the, the Sino-Japanese War accelerated Jap Japan's rapid transformation from a nation state to a colonial powers with no peer in Asia. So they're basically going to become the most dominant or uh, most dominant uh, Asian nation in the world during this time period. So China used to be number one and rapidly they are going to lose it to a much smaller nation. Um, all right. So Japanese, like Europeans, viewed colonial subjects as racially inferior and not worthy of citizenship. Because if you were as am my equal, I wouldn't have beat you. But since I beat you, I don't want to mix with you. Miss me with that. And then we'll see they're going to expect their colonies to serve the economic interests of the metropolitan center. So just like in Europe, we're looking for raw goods, we're looking for labor, we're looking for all things that we can extract from this area to make the mother country or, or the bigger country or the imperializing country or the colonizing country um, more dominant and more in power and have more resources and more goods and life more better for their citizens. All right, so our Japanese expansion between 1870 and 1910. These arrows are going to show you how and where um, Japan is going to attack during the uh, Sino-Japanese War between 1894 and 1895, and then also the Russo-Japanese or the Russian and Japanese War between 1904 and 1905. All right, and then we also see where uh, Korea is going to be acquired as a protectorate in 1905 um, by uh, Japan. Okay, so they're going to lose, like, so China's going to lose that and all that. Okay, and then we even go up a little bit higher and we see the Japanese empire is going to be spread all the way up here because they have a sphere of influence where they're dominating, controlling. Um, everything, the, 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 the economy, the trading, the things that are happening politically and all that stuff. And who's allowed to even go in those areas as well. All right, so let's move on to Russia. So once again, we always lump Russia and Japan together when it comes to industrializing because they kind of had similar ways. They had to really rely on the government to help them out. So we have Russian transformation and um, expansion. So Russia started um, expanding as a civilized mission, civilizing mission in need to defend against expanding German, British, Chinese, and Japanese forces. Um, Hmm. Mm -hmm. And Japanese forces. Huh. Interesting. Okay. All right. Um, and so um, we see they're going to expand um, southwest from the Caucasus Mountains all the way to Turkestan. Um, so a pretty wide area. We'll see it on one of the upcoming maps. I'll show you guys how wide it is. And they're going to expand east into Manchuria. So we touching on China. It's like we've been to have some beef popping off between Russia and China, uh, uh, Russia and Japan, excuse me. All right. So modernization, internal reforms happening in Russia. So we have Tsar uh, Alexander II is going to launch the wave of great reforms. So things that had never happened before. We, we need these reforms to happen. 1861, emancipation of peasants from serfdom. Just like in Japan, you are free from this land, okay? Boom, that rhymed, I like that. 
And then we see reduction of duration of military service. Um, so you're no longer, you know, essentially forced to be in the military for most of, you're a male, um, for most of your childbearing uh, age when you're, you're at your youth, basically. Um, you're able to, you know, have a life. It's crazy. Okay. Um, all right. And let's move on. We're gonna see, we're gonna launch a mass education system. So education is the way to the future. Literacy is the way to the future. And so they're going to make a, make that a priority for the country. They're gonna develop railroads, industrial production and mining, just like in other places as well. So they're gonna see the benefit, uh, or they're gonna rapidly see the benefit of developing their railroads and all those things like that. Um, so reform is gonna strengthen the state, but did not enhance the lives of the common people. So the country gets more unified, but everyday people are not going to feel the benefits of that unification. Landholders kept the best land and starts had to pay large redemption taxes for the poor quality land they received. So I can't believe it. They got, they didn't get the, so, but they, they got some, all right, they got land if you're a peasant, but unfortunately you were not able to get the best land and you had to pay taxes on it as well as you had to, you know, deal with the fact that it was poor quality, low nutrient and not really good for production of uh, farming uh, for crops and things like that. All right, and the press, the court and the people in the street are gonna denounce the regime. So they're gonna be like, yo, this is actually supposed to be better for us, but in actuality, it is worse for us um, because we still don't have access to so much stuff, okay? All right, so in 1881, the czar was killed by a terrorist bomb. So they're gonna be, okay, all right. So the terrorist bomb, I just read it. I just saw it on page 662. Yeah, it's okay. All right, so we'll move on though. I know it's somewhere on page 62 and I just can't find it right now and that's okay, but just know it's there. It's highlighted on my page, I just can't find it. All right, so then we have Lee, uh, Leo Tolstoy um, wrote the dip despotic government and wrote about the despotic government in War and Peace. So in Russia where we have a lot of the counter movements to what was happening in society today. So we'll talk about those in the next few slides. Um, so the territorial expansion. So we have Russia conquered much of the Caucasus Mountains to prevent the Ottomans or Persians from encroaching. So they're trying to save their land and they're trying to protect it from the people who are going to take it over. The Ottomans and the Persians are both known for being conquerors and, and uh, using their military might to expand the territory. So Russia's like, either we get unified now or we won't have the territory later. Um, Russia's going to fight the British over Turkestan, India, Iran, and Afghanistan. And their most impressive expansion is going to be into East Asia and the area north of Manchuria. So that we'll see it on the map in a second. Russia's going to found the East Asia Pacific Ocean port city of Vladivostok. Vladivostok, meaning rule of the East. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Russian's not too good. Um, and then also we're going to see that Russia is going to make some money by getting out of North America. They're going to sell all of their territory in North America, now known as Alaska to the U.S., okay? And Alaska is going to officially become a state in the U.S. Um, in, 18, in 1959, excuse me. And they're going to build the Trans-Siberian Railroad stretching from Moscow to East Asia, completed in 1916. So a lot of rapid industrialization, a lot of rapid... Um, infrastructure being built and all of these things are dictated by the government. So in Europe, we had investors who had idea, or we had inventors who had ideas, found an investor, created a project, helped to industrialize society in that way. And then the government kind of caught up after the fact. In Japan and Russia, because they did not have those inventors and investors and all those ideas that kind of helped them at the beginning, they had to use their governments to unify the country first and after they unified the country then they would then um, build infrastructure and things that needed that were needed to take over all right so our russian expansion happening over about a hundred year time year hundred year time period from 1801 to 1914. Um, so we see the Russian expansion in 1794, and then we see how it's going to expand all the way until 1914. And so here is China down here. And so here's that Mongolian peer, uh, portion that is gonna be under uh, Russian control. Here is the Manchurian portion that's gonna be occupied um, by Russia, but it's gonna be taken over once again by Japan from 1905 until 1910 in that area. Okay. Um, so here's the battle. Here's Japan. 
here's Russia, and here are the other places that are going to be taken over um, in between those areas. All right, and we are coming to the end, our last four slides. So ch challenges of Russian territorial expansionism. Um, so governing a diverse area or a diverse empire, just like the Ottomans, just like so many other people, how do I govern all these freaking people? Um, the huge empire was only partially effective in integrating its diverse parts um, into political communities. Well, duh, because everyone doesn't previously have the same political styles. So they're not all gonna be accustomed to what's happening and they're gonna take a moment to kind of get accustomed, acquainted to it. So Russia is going to tolerate and it's going to tax new people instead of displacing or slaughtering native populations as in the US. So they're going to say, hey, we're going to tolerate you, just pay us some money and we'll leave you alone. Versus the US was like, I want your land, Native Americans, and I'm going to kill you to get it. All right. So we see the Russians are going to repress some groups of so the Polish people and the Jewish, and they're going to favor the Baltic Germans and the Finnish people. So we're going to see this kind of mixed bag on how they're going to treat people. So they're going to be kind of less harsh than the U.S. in some ways, but they're going to be more targeted of other populations and of other groups. So Russia is going to face constant perceived threats from the Persians, from the Ottomans, um, the British troops, and the Japanese as well. So they're under constant attack all the time as they expand their empire. All right, let's leave Russia uh, or the Russian Empire and just drop a little bit further south and go into what little land China is kind of controlling right now or I won't say little land, they have a lot of land, but they're losing their territory and their dominance. The Qing were more concerned about internal revolts than the threats from the West. So once again, the Qing are not concerned about what's happening outside of their borders or the people outside of their borders or even trying to revolutionize and modernize just like what's happening around the world. They're more concerned about the internal struggles that they're happening there. Um, so we're going to see they're going to eventually, though, adopt Western learning and skills. So growing number of Chinese were troubled by the threat of European superiority of military and uh, arm, military arms and technology. So in the 1860s, we're going to see that self-strengthening movement pop up. Um, and that's going to um, basically, we're going to see that they're going to, Chinese people are going to adopt Western learning and technological skills, but keep their, their Chinese culture intact. So learning and technological skills from the West cool but the chinese culture is going to still maintain its, its, its authority and it's 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 uh, being on top they're going to build arsenals shipyards coal mines steamships and schools for learning foreign ways and languages so once again they're going to put more emphasis in learning things from outside of their borders for the first time in a long time um, then we're going to see one person is Yung Wing is going to send 120 students to study abroad in different parts of the world and then bring back the information that they learned to Chinese culture to strengthen Chinese culture. So we're all, we are going to see conservative pushback. So conservative, those who are like um, want to go back to that Confucius ideals, um, those who are holding on to those, they're going to push back. And so eventually, though, we're going to see those study abroad students are going to be forced to return after the U.S. is going to reject them from their military academies. Um, so the U.S. is like, why would we educate our enemies? Doesn't seem smart. Um, and so they're going to kind of reject them and push them back. All right, and then also another thing too, we're gonna to see the first railroad is gonna be torn up in 1877, shortly after it is built in China. So they made progress and then the conservatives in the country were like, not so much. Go back to how it was before, we liked it better. All right, so then we are gonna see some new technologies are gonna be adopted. So we have Chinese language newspapers. We have newspapers being printed now, um, you know, and so we, we have those, uh, so we had the printing press originate in China, but you know the Gutenberg printing press are being able to or creating these newspaper plates. We're able to kind of rapidly produce newspapers over and over and over again. Um, that's going to take off and being brought into China as well. And then telegraph lines, so easier communication happening between the people. Last two slides. So continuing on, so internal. So China's gonna de be defeated in the Sino-Japanese War and it's gonna lead to serious attempts at reforms. So they're gonna be like, oh crap, we messed up, homie. Let's get it together. So we're gonna see the 100 days of reform, which is gonna happen from June to September of 1898. And we're gonna see the scholar Kang Yue and his student Ling Qiu Chao 
Um, they're going to come together and advocate for the development of railroads, state banking, a modern postal system, and institutions to foster agriculture, industry, and commerce. So they're looking for ways to bring and re revolutionize and modernize China so that it can stop being left behind and stop being attacked by Japan and stop being attacked by Russia and stop being attacked by so many other European nations that they can actually have a little bit of autonomy for themselves. So then we have Empress Taoist uh, CZ, who's going to be placed on the throne, who's going to rescind these reforms, and it's going to execute um, six of the reform's major leaders. So basically, some of the people who were trying to get reform were some of her nephews, and she's going to be like, yeah, nephew, I don't like what you got to say, you could die. And so she's going to really like forcefully um, bring um china i guess like back to where it was before but what that looks like from the outside world so when europe sees that they're like yo there's some civil wars happening in china they need more input from white people so we're going to see unfortunately more imperialism kind of come in because it's, it's they're seen as kind of disordered and, and not together so the Chinese Qing government's refusal of reform and ineffective reforms of the country vulnerable to both internal instability and external aggression. So it's going to make them a bigger target because they're having so many issues. And we have reached the end, my friend. Chapter 17 is done. So between 1850 and, seven, and 1850, 1914, the majority of the world's population um, lived in empires or overseas colonies and not in nation states. So after 1914, we're moving into this nation state. Before then, we're just living um, in empires or overseas colonies, but that's the majority of the world population, okay? But after 1914, these nations are going to arise. The idea of a people was easier in concept than reality. So once again, in Europe, same history, traditions, culture, language, yes. But then you go into other places in those same European nations that were talking about culture, history, language, you're like, oh, where's the money? For many societies, colonization was intertwined with an integral to nation building. So once again, as these um, countries colonized, they were able to fortify and strengthen their own borders at home in Europe and in the US. So they used another country to make themselves stronger and better. So there's still this belief that South American nations or African nations or even certain parts of Asia um, or Southeast Asia don't have resources and they're struggling and they're poor. But in actuality, all their resources have just been taken to Europe and the US. And if maybe those people were allowed to profit off their own resources and not always have to produce them for other places, they might be in a different place in the world. So not all people identify with nation state or empires as the concept of nation state certainly did not eliminate ethnic ethnics, class, or gender inequalities. So we're still seeing the hypocrisies being shown throughout history in this time period specifically. So we have this nation state, yes, but everyone's not always unified and on the same page of what that looks like because human beings are unique. They are different. And just because they may have some similarities, they are, there's going to be some differences somewhere. Um, unintended consequences of nation building was that it sparked colonized people, racial and ethnic minorities to redefine the ideas of language of nation and assert the values of self-determination. So they're literally, colonized countries are literally watching Europe and uh, Amer the US, of the United States of America um, take over and, I and identify what, what a nation is and what that looks like and, and how people are supposed to act. Well, guess what? You just gave all those colonized people's great ideas. And we're going to see in the future, moving into the 19, uh, 1900s, what that's going to look like as people start to advocate more for self-determination or the right to govern yourself, um, as well as advocating for more autonomy, the ability to govern themselves. I mean, just everything for themselves without having the input of that, um, that, that country. So we're going to kind of move away from paternalism as we move further into the future. All right, so Filipinos and Cubans are going to quote from the American Declaration of Independence. Uh-oh, so the U.S. gave them ideas, but it's not giving them independence just yet. <laughs> Koreans are going to define themselves as a nation. It's going to be crushed and oppressed by Japan. So we are, they have a unified culture, history, traditions, whatever, but it's still not respected as a traditional nation because Japan sees themselves as being better than Korea um, and therefore... Um, doesn't care about their cultures, does not, doesn't really respect them. And so what does that look like too? And then the Indians are going to shame the British for violating English standards of fair play. So they're literally, these colonized countries are literally looking at what 
these uh year these these uh what these imperial nations are doing and it's like ah, 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 there's some hypocrisy i don't like that you little hypocrite and i'm going to identify the hypocrisy and make you change or at least bring your hypocrisy to the forefront so the world can see what you are up to and what you've been doing all right that's it chapter 17 is done um enjoy these videos i hope you guys are getting something out of it i tried to add as much context as possible because this is the heart of your 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 chat your test you're going to do a lot of things from this time period so um just make sure you guys are studying and know what's happening in chapter 17. all right have a great rest of your day and i'll see you in class sometime soon